Howdy. Over 20 years, the show SpongeBob has inevitably stumbled on some pretty serious subjects. So today, I'd like to look over these episodes. We can decide if they are handled with respect and care, or if the subject was completely fumbled. There have been so many subjects, from addiction to OCD to a midlife crisis to racism, even murder. But more on that later. So let's check out the 10 SpongeBob episodes that dealt with serious issues. And if you're familiar with my show, you probably know which of my friends I'm gonna ask to help us chat about these. Hey Strider, it's nice to be back. Ah, hey, it's good to see you, George. This topic is certainly familiar for me. In my older videos, I've talked about a lot of kids' shows that dealt with serious issues. Indeed you have, my friend, which I think makes us the perfect team to tackle these episodes together. Sounds great. I'm ready when you are. Okay, great. On to the countdown. For number 10. I gotta sneak one. Just one. Then I'm off the stuff for good. Just one bite. For the subject of addiction. Huh. The perspective here is an interesting one. We get a much closer look at the mindset of someone completely addicted to something and how it affects them on the inside. I personally tend to think of food addictions for this one. You know, chocolate, cheesecake, or fried foods or something. In this case, I think it's more of the fried foods, since Squidward is now addicted to Krabby Patties. But at any cost, he does not want to let SpongeBob know. After that performance, he'd never let me live it down. It's pretty intense when we see the deep craving Squidward has for this fried burger, watching carefully every tiny dance of flavor and fat fried off the patties. Squidward throughout the episode is just tortured by his new craving for these burgers, even to the point of fantasizing about marrying and growing old with the Krabby Patty in his dreams. Okay, maybe Squidward has a personal lustfulness for fried meat? I don't know. What do I have to do? Eat one out of the garbage? I mean, whatever floats your boat, man. You ain't hurting nobody. Obviously, this is all meant to further hammer home to us how obsessed Squidward is with the Krabby Patty. And eventually, he does get his wish. He gets access to the Patty Vault. Unfortunately, it goes straight to his thighs. And then you blow up! This episode mainly focuses on the potential power of addiction. However, I think there's one more thing that could have been addressed here, and that's Squidward's recovery from addiction. Perhaps if Squidward had refrained from that momentary desire and impulse, maybe that desire would have slowly weakened as time went on. While addiction itself is a deeply complex psychological subject, I think this introduces both kids and adults to what addiction can be like. Addiction is certainly no easy subject to tackle, but I think Just One Bite at least gives a clear perspective on how challenging addiction can be to handle. And for number 9... Suds for addressing the dangers of self-medication and not seeing a doctor. This one's early on in the list because I personally think the dangers of self-medication is a pretty important subject right now. So while retention rates are still somewhat high, I wanted to talk about this early. Plus, it's a flimsy pretense to bring a friend of mine out of retirement to talk about it. Hey Strider, good to see you again. Ah, oh, hey Jem, good to see you on video again, man. Hiya George. Oh, hey Jem, nice to meet you. Likewise, so this episode is actually an old favorite of mine. In fact, it's probably the first Spongebob episode I noticed that talked about a serious problem. When Spongebob gets sick with the suds, he initially does the smart thing and plans to go to the doctor. I'm sick, Patrick. I'm going to the doctor. Unfortunately, annoying old Patrick gives Spongebob misinformation and scares him out of going to the doctor. <laughs> What's great about this episode is its subtlety. When you get down to it, this episode is hammering into your head the reality of how dangerous it can be to self-medicate. But it's doing it in all the right ways. Exactly. One of the good examples of this is using Sandy as a voice of reason. But she's not just getting the message across verbally. That would probably portray her as naggy. Patrick, SpongeBob has to see a real doctor. You should be arrested for impersonating a doctor. Hey, don't do that! <laughs> Take that, you dumb squirrel! No, they show us rather than tell us. A great example of that is Patrick's montage of terrible treatment attempts. Which gets me to point number two. It doesn't use these treatments as fear tactics to get its message across. The treatments are all presented in really clever, charming ways, yet still very subtle. Like creating a random drug cocktail, using physical treatments, treatments for other conditions. Hell, they even end it with what I can only assume is dark magic. 
One of my favorite treatments is when Patrick literally puts a band-aid over SpongeBob's problem. And if that isn't a good analogy for self-medication, I don't know what is. I'm surprised Patrick didn't just sweep SpongeBob under the rug. I think we're also given a more eerie message. Just how hard it is to tell if self-medicating is doing anything beyond just making you worse. Like Spongebob thinking that because Patrick's treatment is resulting in no bubbles, it must be working. He doesn't realize or is simply ignoring the fact that the treatments are clearly making him worse. I still remember seeing this episode as a kid and I never felt like I was being nagged to. I was shown rather than told the dangers of not seeing a doctor about sickness. I feel as good as new. I love the doctor. Call me crazy, but I'd actually like to see this episode shown in classes at schools. Because as a 90s kid, I remember the lesson of this episode way better than anything my teachers told me. Because I'd argue teaching kids to trust the doctor over, I don't know, the internet, politicians, or your friends is probably a pretty important lesson. Yes, Suds is an episode that gives both teachers and parents a great platform to talk to their kids about these serious topics. Agreed. Oh, looks like we're running overtime again. It was good to see you, Jim. It's always a pleasure to have you on the show. No problem, Strider. I'm headed back to editing only work, though. The segment's not going to edit itself. But until we meet again... Much obliged, my friend. It's good to still have you here in some capacity. Number 8 squirrel jokes and its discussion of racism. With only one of her kind in all of Bikini Bottom, Sandy is absolutely a minority. She's someone who came from far off lands alone with no support networks and built herself a home in a foreign land. I think she's a really strong character that way. It's part of why she's one of my favorite characters. Unfortunately, in this episode, she starts off as the butt of SpongeBob's jokes. Did you ever notice how big squirrel's teeth are? <laughs> That's true. Huh? This here is a pretty good take on how xenophobic jokes can lead to stereotyping, and how this stereotyping can negatively influence how other groups are perceived. Hey, look, guys, it's the stupid squirrel. I know, let's try and communicate with it. Apparently, Mr. Krabs has started a comedy club, and SpongeBob is up on stage. Unfortunately, most of his jokes stink until he gets a response by resorting to cheap laughs and stereotyping his close friend Sandy. SpongeBob is conflicted because he's getting an audience response when he's using cheap jokes at Sandy's expense, but he knows it's hurting Sandy's feelings and how she's being treated by people. When I saw SpongeBob drop the mic and supposedly choose his friend over this lowbrow comedy, I felt really proud of him. But my heart sank when I saw him dive out, continuing his charade of cheap laughs. I can imagine some people saying SpongeBob is too insensitive in this episode, and that's fair. But I think seeing Spongebob hurt Sandy like this makes the message more memorable. Plus, it leads to Sandy demonstrating how drastically different she is from the stereotype Spongebob has painted of her. You look like you've got a strong opinion on this, Strider. What's on your mind? Well, if I may share my own experience of my five or so years on YouTube, my preference has always been on making jokes at the expense of myself. To me, being the butt of the joke is way more thrilling than putting anyone else on the line. On TV tropes, they call this term being a a butt monkey, and I kind of like that term. Yeah, I can see that. I think there needs to be a balance. It's good to be humble and to have humility, but I don't think anyone should constantly be a butt monkey. Sure, you can laugh at yourself, but don't be the class clown that everyone picks on, you know? But that's just me. We all gotta laugh at ourselves once in a while. I do it all the time. Ah! Ah! I think squirrel jokes can remind viewers of something important. There is more comedians out there than there have ever been in history. And if all a comedian can contribute is cheap jokes and stereotyping at the expense of others, then maybe they shouldn't be a comedian. But to be fair, by the end, SpongeBob's jokes do get a lot better. He's able to start making fun of himself. And because they're good jokes, the crowd laughs along with him. That's true. He even pokes some fun at Mr. Krabs, who also laughs. <laughs> In fact, not one person in the room is offended. I think Squirrel Jokes handles the subject of racism pretty well, and SpongeBob walks away learning something right along with the viewer. Number 7 Squid's Day Off for its addressing of obsessive compulsive disorder. Man, this one hit me hard. As someone with OCD myself, I could really empathize with Squidward here. The episode's all about Squid's breakdown as he continually feels overwhelming compulsions and what-if panic when he leaves SpongeBob to run the restaurant by himself. 
So the story is, Mr. Krabs has lost his arms in a kitchen accident, and is rushed to the hospital. So he decides to leave Squidward in charge of the restaurant. At first, this seems like a dream come true to Squidward, as he can leave SpongeBob in charge of everything. But even as he tries to relax, he can't help but feel overwhelmed with fear that something bad will happen if he doesn't continually check the restaurant and check with SpongeBob over every tiny detail. Fortunately, SpongeBob is a very competent worker and has everything well in hand. But Squidward's anxiety keeps convincing him that something horrible will happen if he doesn't keep checking in. <laughs> The inner conflict OCD can have on people is very real here. Squidward is struggling as he's caving to his anxiety and following the compulsion to check. Unfortunately, this will just make his anxiety and compulsions even worse. He's just reinforcing them. Now, repeat after me. You will not go back to the Krusty Krab. I will destroy the Krusty Krab. Ah! <laughs> now you might be saying, why is Squidward acting this crazy? But I think this episode highlights that these compulsions are very real, as illogical as they are to many people in the world. 2% of Americans, if you're curious. That being said, it's a great episode that's legitimately funny. And I like the fact that I can look at this and see, hey, it's happening to Squidward too. Let's me chuckle. If these compulsions were a recurring theme for Squidward, it could very well have destroyed his life. Fortunately, he's back to his old self in the next episode. <laughs> Number 6. Pickles for its addressing of anxiety. If you've ever known someone that struggled with anxiety, or maybe even been that person yourself, you can probably empathize with Spongy's situation, at least a little here. So, what's the story for this one, George? Well, SpongeBob is challenged to make a perfect burger for a picky customer, but he thinks he forgot the pickles, which triggers him to be so crippled by anxiety that he could barely function anymore. Bun down, shoe, mustard, pan. I like how it's portrayed that this anxiety slowly creeps up on Spongebob. As the anxiety gets worse throughout the episode, he slowly becomes less functional, to the point where he can't even calm down enough to sleep. Wait, this isn't right either. Nope. Uh-uh. Negative. Come on, come on, get it right. It's one thing for Spongebob to be physically incapacitated in an episode like Suds, but this episode shows us he can be mentally incapacitated as well. He's constantly anxious that he can't ever get anything right ever again. I anything can't do right since because pickles. I think don't ready back to go to work, Mr. Krabs. Oh, Beegis, this part is so real. I can't even tell you how many times I've been mentally exhausted enough that I can't even string a sp blah, 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 blah. I can't tell you how many times I've been mentally exhausted enough that I can't even string a coherent sentence together. I noticed in my community when I spoke to people that a lot of people who are on the spectrum like myself tend to relate to this episode a whole lot. And I wonder if that's because many people on the spectrum can get very jumbled up like Spongebob is here very easily. We get that, you know? Why don't you take the rest of the day off? Oh no, Mr. Krabs! Fortunately, Mr. Krabs eventually steps in to help Spongebob get his confidence back. In fact, he stays alongside Spongebob for days and nights, patiently trying to help him. And that's really cool of Mr. Krabs. Yeah, that's a really nice portrayal of Krabs. I kind of wish he was this considerate more often and not just a greedy jerk all the time. I'd like him more. Anyway, when Spongebob is finally rehabilitated, Krabs and he discover that Bubble Bass, the picky customer, had actually hid the pickles under his tongue the whole time. And there's the pickles from last time, too! And... There's my ride. <laughs> well, unfortunately, not everyone can slide back quite so smoothly from this level of anxiety. It's always nice to see SpongeBob make a full recovery, and it's nice to see the subject of anxiety addressed at all. Number 5. Selling out for addressing getting old and retirement. This one's a bit of a weasel call, because technically, getting old and retirement aren't really serious issues. That's just life. But I thought that selling out addressed some issues within retirement that were very real issues. I think viewers generally recommended this episode because of the message on conglomerates buying smaller businesses, but I personally think it addresses another subject even more strongly. And that is how retirement can affect people. I've heard some people dream of retirement as this perfect time where their lives are better. 
But I feel like Krabs' story gives us a more realistic picture of what can happen when someone just suddenly stops working. You see, in this episode, Krabs sells the Krusty Krab to a corporation for lots of money. And thus, he's done. He's retired. And he gets to go out with a bucket load of money. Just what he always wanted. Well, I've done everything I wanted to do. And it's not even noon. But wait, you may ask, shouldn't he be happy and fulfilled? After all, he isn't working anymore. Isn't that what many people dream of? Well, maybe for some people, but Krabs finds himself unsatisfied and bored. You know, I actually studied this phenomenon back in my second year at university in psychology. Essentially, elderly people who continued working suffered significantly less depression, cognitive difficulties, and had a higher life satisfaction than those who completely retired. Or they did volunteer work instead, which gave them even healthier results. Huh. Really? I didn't realize volunteer work could be so healthy for people. But as for Mr. Krabs' story, Pearl is tired of having Krabs bothering her at home. So she says Krabs needs to get a hobby or start working again. Well, actually, I was hoping you and I could do something together. Get out! This really captures the strange existential discomfort people can suddenly face when they go from working full time to suddenly doing nothing. Something some people dream for decades of achieving can turn out to be boring. It's not exactly a revolutionary concept, really. That being somewhat busy is good for you, but it can be understandably easy to forget when people are working long hours in jobs and looking forward to not working anymore. The irony is palpable when Eugene decides to rejoin the Krusty Krab as a dishwasher, aka the now rebranded Krabio Mondays. Mr. Krabs, what are you doing here? Retirement ain't all it's cracked up to be. So I'm the new busboy. Now let me make it clear, I'm certainly not saying something like jobs are the only thing that define us. SpongeBob You're Fired made a point like that and it was horrible and wrong. But for someone like Krabs, his whole world has been accumulating money and working at his restaurant for decades. He even reminds us of this with a song about how much he loves money at the start of the episode. But when he's suddenly given all the money he could ever want and doesn't want to work anymore, he finds himself needing a new sense of purpose. And if he's not going to take up new hobbies, get friends outside of work, or at least start more walking, then maybe Krabs is better off just keeping on working. I personally think this episode addresses one of the most adult lessons we can ever learn. In our constant strive to make lives easier, we can realize that life being easier doesn't necessarily mean life will be happier. The Krusty Krab is ours again! Number 4. Plankton Paranoia for its discussion of terror and panic attacks. Hey, didn't we already cover this episode? I think it was the Darkest Nickelodeon episodes. Yeah, originally back in Darkest Nickelodeon episodes, we covered this one. But I just kept thinking back on this episode. And I just couldn't think of any other SpongeBob episode that quite so vividly covers the effects of a panic attack. <laughs> As well as anxiety attacks and the general power terror can have over us, there are many awful emotions people have to deal with. Hatred, envy, righteous anger. But I would personally say the most powerful and potentially all-consuming of these emotions is terror. Terror is an emotion that can completely devour us if we let it. And we see that demonstrated by Krabs in this episode, as he rapidly loses his mind more and more over the terror of Plankton potentially sneaking into his store. At first, his fear starts slowly. Krabs starts losing interest in customers who get in the way of him finding Plankton. Eventually, he loses interest in all of his customers, locking them inside with him on the lookout for Plankton. A frustrating part about Panic is it's a self-eating python. As a person gets more and more sleep deprived from fear, the fear can get even worse as we lose even more sight of reality and the moment. In Krabs' case, he's starting to see enemies where there are none. Mr. Krabs, I don't think Plankton's coming. Nonsense! <laughs> See? A good example is when Krabs starts assuming his customers are working for Plankton, eventually even suspecting his girlfriend, Mrs. Puff. Hang on, those two are dating? Yeah, they sure are. Don't you remember that season 3 episode, Krusty Love? Oh yeah, that was a nice episode. They were pretty smitten with each other. Eh, yeah, good for them. Anyway, it's pretty clear by the halfway mark that Krabs is losing any side of reality whatsoever. 
At this point, Krabs hasn't slept for days, and the combination of sleep deprivation and terror can be a seriously dangerous combination. Soon he begins seeing plankton delusions everywhere. It's actually pretty confronting to see Krabs just drowning in his own fears. I personally felt that if Krabs had had more experience with paranoia, or maybe had learnt some relaxation techniques like deep breathing, he could have better taken hold of the panic and grounded himself back in reality. But I get the impression Krabs is the kind of guy who's never stopped to deep breathe or meditate in his life. If I asked him, he'd probably say, time is money. Get back to work! Fortunately, Krabs' friends, including Plankton, do eventually get through to him. You see, it turns out Plankton was just planning a surprise party for Krabs. Ah, I still think this is a really sweet ending to an otherwise pretty bleak story. But I think the episode still serves as an important reminder of keeping fear in check and keeping one foot grounded in reality. Number 3 the Krabby Chronicle for discussing misinformation and sensationalism. Ah, <sighs> misinformation. I'd say it's one of our key concerns right now in modern society. Because right now, it's an ever-growing venomous anaconda that most of us are trying to stomp out. It's certainly very relevant in today's society. Anyways, Krabs starts a newspaper stand for easy money, and quickly discovers that he can get more eyes on his content by misleading his readers. Hmm, this sounds kind of familiar to another platform we know, huh, Strider? <sighs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? In this case, Mr. Krabs tries to get more traffic by encouraging his journalist SpongeBob to color up the stories a bit. Now that's a juicy story! And by that, of course, he means outright lie to sell papers. Don't think of it as lying, boy! Think of it as, uh, a practical joke! The message here doesn't feel too heavy, but at the same time, it's very understandable. Krabs can sell more papers if he lies, but what's the consequences of lying to his readers? Well, papers like Mr. Krabs can help contribute to a stagnant, gossipy, trashy landscape where some people are disillusioned by the sad state of society simply by opening their paper to sensationalist garbage. I don't think these stories are doing anyone any good. But, as Krabs points out... Well, they're certainly doing me some good. Can you believe it? Is it worth SpongeBob maintaining his journalistic integrity? Or is that just a marketing concept to sell tofu? I think the answer to that depends on the person you ask and their own perspective. Isn't there a way we could write juicy stories without hurting people? Can most people produce content that's interesting without it being at the expense of others? I think the answer to that depends on the person you ask and their own perspective. Well, in this case, Krabs ends up seeing the consequences of his stories at the expense of others and loses all the money he made. I think it's not only a strong message about the potentially slippery slope of journalism, but about the slippery slope of entertainment in general. And I personally think Krabby Chronicles delivers this message elegantly. How's it going, lad? Ah, it's a surprise! Number 2 are you happy now with this discussion of depression? Goodness, this is easily one of the most controversial SpongeBob episodes ever created. But for me personally, I felt it gave a relatively accurate look at some of the crippling effects of depression. Oh really? How so? Well, the stereotype of depression can often be that it's just feeling sad all the time. But depression is much more complicated than that. Depression can be the loss of all emotional responses. And that is exactly what happens to Squidward here. Yeah. yeah, that's true. Squidward essentially becomes a vegetable, unable to function, go to work, and barely shuffling through the basic necessities of life. From getting out of bed, to getting changed, to cooking for himself. I also give some credit to this episode because apart from the two deleted scenes, I actually feel it handles the subject of depression with reasonable grace and respect. Did you ever notice there's little to no actual jokes in this episode? Yeah, there is a more solemn, serious tone here than usual. SpongeBob himself never actually laughs in this whole episode, which is very unusual for him. He seems to be taking Squidward's depression very seriously. None of the characters are laughing at this situation. Squidward doesn't just roll his eyes through the fact that he doesn't have a happy memory. He earnestly calls out for help from Spongebob. You're right, Spongebob. I don't have a happiest memory. This is horrible. And Spongy is happy to oblige and try his best. These two sincerely try to work together to create happy memories for Squidward. Don't worry, Squidward. I'll help you make a happiest memory. I think this must have taken a lot of restraint from Spongebob because his normal response is to jump in and try to fix the situation. But here, he leaves Squidward alone for two weeks before taking any action 
action. By the two week mark, Squidward is acting almost uncomfortably similar to some people with depression. Even when SpongeBob bangs on Squidward's window, he can't even summon the emotion to tell him to go away. He simply closes himself off further. It's almost tragic to watch. I've heard some people say that they don't like that SpongeBob captures Squidward, but you know, while I'm personally no expert on this, I would personally think that if someone has been alone in their house without leaving for two weeks, maybe it's time for an intervention, if only for the safety and well-being of the person. Even if SpongeBob did kind of mess up by getting Squidward angry, that in itself is an achievement, because Squidward was feeling an emotion again. He was angry, but re-energized and feeling an emotional response, and that means he was connected to life again. So even if Are You Happy Now was kinda clumsily handled at times, I do feel it handles a subject of depression with mostly respect and care. While the two deleted scenes were in poor taste, they were removed from later versions of the episode for this very reason. I'm not saying this episode gets everything perfect, but I think it got a lot of the tone right here. And before we get to number one, just a couple of quick honorable mentions. Sentimental Sponge for its discussion of hoarding. Patrick demands SpongeBob keep stuff for sentimental value, and it quickly devolves into hoarding. And like real hoarding, SpongeBob's problem can become rapidly worse if left unchecked. If you've ever known, or perhaps even been a hoarder, this episode might cut a little deep. Seeing SpongeBob like this, wearing garbage, is legitimately uncomfortable. Even Squidward's house is overwhelmed by SpongeBob's junk. And can I just say, if you've ever been close to a hoarder, does this sanitation police sound like a dream come true to you? Sure, SpongeBob should be given psychological help for his clinical OCD behavior, but you know, at least it's a step in the right direction for SpongeBob's recovery. Props to Squidward in this episode, because he really tries to help SpongeBob recover. He even offers to help SpongeBob preserve the memories of his junk before throwing it away. Personally, I just wish it was this easy for so many people to just toss their junk away like SpongeBob does. Goodbye, little friends. Have fun at the dump! Fear of a Krabby Patty for its discussion of overworking. Krabs asks his staff to work 48 days straight non-stop, until SpongeBob eventually snaps, understandably, and loses his mind. This is probably Krabs at his most despicable and greedy, and that's against some stiff competition. His team is clearly suffering, but even when they desperately need a break as their minds break down, he still tries to get SpongeBob to keep working. SpongeBob was so traumatized by the whole experience, they even had nightmares of Krabby Patties attacking and eating him. Fortunately, Plankton accidentally gives him the therapy and counseling he needs to make a full recovery. I just hope next time, SpongeBob keeps in mind the dangers of overworking, sleep deprivation, and excess stress. I'll always be with you. Right here. In my heart. Actually, in your arteries. Nasty Patty for its discussion of murder. Okay, now this I definitely remember us talking about. Right you are, my friend. And it definitely discusses a very dire, serious issue. Obviously. One that I hope most of us never need to witness. Murder. And the idea that Spongebob and Krabs would try to cover up that murder is pretty demented for a Spongebob episode. But luckily, as we've said, the health inspector does end up waking up. But for a while there, it's very unnerving what we're seeing. Anyway, on to number one. Number one. Fungus Among Us, for its addressing of disease and quarantine. While Quarantine Crabs also discuss this subject, I'd rather respect the wishes of the SpongeBob staff and not show moving clips of this episode. I think I heard about that. Wasn't Quarantine Crabs the band episode? Yep, that's right, spot on. But seriously, we're not missing out on much by skipping it. It's honestly just kind of boring. It's mostly uncomfortable and certainly not funny at all. But if you're curious, my friend Alpha J already did a really good job discussing it. So if you're curious, I'll left a link to his video in the description. So anyway, Fungus Among Us basically shows us the rapid development of this virus slash fungus as SpongeBob's condition gets even worse. And we watch him rapidly spread the virus to everyone in the restaurant, resulting in a full-on restaurant pandemic. What's all the commotion about? 
The commotion, my dear Krabs, is regarding the hygiene standards of your eating establishment, which appear to be inadequate. It's interesting seeing SpongeBob's reactions as the disease gets worse. It feels realistic to see him go into denial, and sadly, not going to see the doctor. Sadly, few other episodes still feel this relevant right now. I can't think of another episode that better demonstrates how a virus can so easily spread and infect others, without someone even noticing the accidental havoc they can cause. And since it's a visible fungus that's spreading, we can actively see how it's spreading. And it spreads a whole lot like how some viruses spread. Every time SpongeBob infects someone, we see it. Eventually, he passes the virus on to Squidward, and even this tiny infection results in him spreading the virus on further until everyone in the restaurant is affected. We even eventually see SpongeBob in quarantine. And if you're feeling uncomfortable seeing this, I can empathize. Oh, Patrick! How many times do I have to tell you? Be careful! Sorry. Hey, wanna play a game of pirate wrestling? Sure, let's begin. And yet it doesn't feel preachy how it's reminding us of that either. It's teaching us through actions and visuals that we can see, understand, and relate to, not just words. We can see how the virus is spreading in the Krusty Krab, so we can learn from their mistakes. But young or old, I've always found myself entertained by this episode at the same time. I call Fungus Among Us, an episode of SpongeBob that deals with a serious issue really well. Now back to work. You know, something I appreciate about these episodes is they're mostly showing, not actually just telling about these issues. SpongeBob doesn't just preach to us directly like some well-meaning Captain Planet episode. He engages with us and directly demonstrates the issue with himself. And sometimes he even demonstrates helpful tips for us better handling these challenges in the real world. And often he can make the viewer laugh while doing it, so we remember the message even better. In my opinion, all these episodes hold some value and can give us a little insight into the real world, while potentially also being entertaining. Kudos to the Spongebob team for helping me grow as a person, and potentially many other people. And thank you for once again joining me, George. You know you're always welcome here, and I appreciate your time. No problem, Strider. I suspect this won't be the last time we'll be talking about a show together. Anyways, see you then. I look forward to next time. Likewise, my friend. And as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.